Good evening, everybody. My name is Josh Davistein. I'm the chair of the Halting Catholic District School Board's Parent Involvement Committee, CPIC. And with me tonight is my past chair, Lisa Coster, and the committee member, Barb Belanger. Tonight, we have our last of our parent speaker series, The Teenage Brain Part 2. We have Dr. Garfield Newman back to talk about 10 ways to grow students' success. Uh, Dr. Garfield Judy Newman is a widely sought after speaker who blends humor with a a deep understanding of effective curriculum design centered ab around the infusion of critical thinking for all. As a senior lecturer at the OI OISE University of Toronto and senior national consultant with the Critical Thinking Consortium, Dr. Garfield has worked with thousands of teachers across grades and subjects, helping them to frame learning around engaging and provocative activities and authentic assessments. Dr. Garfield's reputation as a dynamic and provocative speaker is widespread, and requests for his services have taken him from Asia to the Middle East, Europe, the Caribbean, and across North America. Dr. Garfield's interest is effective in effective teaching and learning has led him to actively exploring the challenges and opportunities presented by teaching and learning in the digital age. Dr. Garfield has spoken across Canada and internationally on critical thinking, brain-compatible classrooms, curriculum design, and effective assessment practice, plus nurturing 21st century skills in a digi digital world. In addition to his work at the University of Toronto and delivering workshops, Dr. Garfield also has authored several articles, chapters in books, and seven textbooks, and has taught in the faculties of education at York University and the University of British Columbia. Before I give the floor to Dr. Garfield, I just want to mention that this session is being recorded, plus, um, if you have any questions, there's a tab on your screen that says questions when you are uh, either technical or for Dr. Garfield. When you type those in, um, any question with Dr. Garfield, we will answer um, a few at the end of this presentation. So without much further ado, Dr. Garfield. Hi, good evening everyone. Hope you've enjoyed the lovely weather today. Um, this is our um, our second session, as Josh mentioned, and uh, the first one, I don't know how many of you were able to join us for the first one, but we more generally explored uh, kind of developments in the teen brain and, and how it helps us understand what children are going through as they enter adolescence. The second part is to link that to more directly to their learning. And in fact, uh, my own journey, uh, my own uh, journey into, into critical thinking was through this, uh, through this path. Uh, a number of years ago, I began. Uh, I was teaching high school, and I was interested in understanding the teen brain as a way to help me uh, prepare better lessons and materials for students. And the more I looked into uh, what the brain research was telling me, the more I realized that helping students be good thinkers, helping develop the frontal cortex in the brain, um, the better that aligned to creating what we would call a brain-compatible classroom. So this evening, I wanted to loop back a little bit and uh, to share a little bit of the, the pieces that we did last time on brain research and how that affects how our children learn, uh, and then spend the second part of the evening looking at critical thinking, looking at how, uh, how we really focused on critical thinking and what we can do as parents to help. So I'm starting off the evening with this cartoon you can see on the screen where the teacher is saying just go to www.criticalthinking.com and click on answers. Uh, with the point being that's of course what we don't want to have happening. That, but the answers that we want students to think about don't lie in a textbook on the computer and so on, but rather it's, it's the use of information um, that, that will help students arrive at thoughtful answers. So we're going to play a little bit with, with these two pieces, a little bit more in brain research. and. Um, what does that look like when we help support students as thinkers in the 21st century world? So, um, just to start us off, I just want to mention uh, one of the gurus in education and digital technology that, that I, I enjoy listening to is John Seeley Brown. And John Seeley Brown, uh, I just have a, a little diagram of his up here, he talks about the need to nurture entrepreneurial learners. And I just want you to to think that one through a little bit, he talks about entrepreneurial learners, which is not to say we want all our children to become entrepreneurs, but rather an entrepreneurial learner, someone who can seize almost any opportunity as an opportunity to learn something. So when John Silly Brown talks about entrepreneurial learning, 
he sees technology, and I know many of us can be frustrated with teens constantly having their face in front of some screen or another, but used well, technology can be what he calls a curiosity amplifier, that, that they have access, our children have access to the information that almost anything that comes up they can quickly check into, look into. So used as a tool to nurture curiosity can be a powerful tool to support learning. I think many of us, our frustrations though are that, that students and children too quickly accept whatever they find on the internet. So our job is to help students be thoughtful users of the technology. Uh, not merely um, consumers of information, but thoughtful users of information, so they can become truly entrepreneurial learners. So I want to just um, pick up a couple of things. I may have mentioned these last time, my apologies, but I am uh, assuming we may have a few different folks tonight. So I just want to mention a couple of books. Um, Growing Up Digital, Don Tapscott, a professor at the University of Toronto, I wrote a book, you can see the subtitle, How the Net Generation is Changing Your World. Uh, really interesting book that looks at how kids growing up in a digital world, how their brains are being wired differently. And I, I mentioned in our last session in May that if you only have time for one chapter, chapter four in this book focuses on how children's brains are being wired differently when they grow up in the digital world. And the last page of that chapter looks at seven things you can do to help nurture a sharper mind. So it's an interesting chapter, just how our kids say, how are their brains being wired differently as a result of the world they're growing up in. The next book, just to I'll mention briefly, oops, this to go up here for me. The Female Brain, I mentioned last time. Um, Luann Brizendine has taken a look at the research into how our brains differ, how females and males' brains are wired differently. Uh, it takes an interesting look starting at conception and then working through life chronologically, uh, how the female brain is different than the male brain. So the, the interesting thing about this book is, is if you have a daughter who's three or four years old, you could read that chapter, you can read the chapter on the seven or eight year old or the teen brain or the, the mummy brain is quite interesting, why, why mothers have so much, you know, not mothers but sorry, people in, in, during pregnancy have such a difficult time remembering and thinking clearly. Uh, the postmenopausal brain. I mean, each chapter is another stage of life and provides some fascinating insights. So, interesting to look at. And by the way, you'll learn as much about a male brain as you will the female brain. And the other one that we mentioned last time, but I want to mention again, Carol Dweck, a professor at Columbia University, has written a book called Mindset that is uh, quite widely uh, known now in education. And Carol Dweck looks at, at different mindsets or habits that students develop She'll talk about a growth versus a fixed mindset. That when children have a fixed mindset, uh, that means that you know, they already have a belief that they can't do something. And if they have that belief, then uh, it inhibits their success. Whereas if you have a growth mindset and you're struggling with something, you see it as a challenge. You try harder, you persevere. So what we want to nurture in our children is a growth mindset. And the way we talk to our children, the kind of encouragement we give them can accidentally create a fixed or a growth mindset. So I mean, the final chapter in this book is called Great Parents, Great Teachers. And, and if you only have time for one chapter, that final chapter has some wonderful advice on how we need to encourage our children. Uh, just a, a quick example, our, our daughter who plays piano, uh, and we would, in the past, we would praise her for how, how talented she is, and we would tell her how proud we are because she's such a talented pianist. And one night she turned to us and said, well, if I'm so talented, then why do I have to practice every night? And it was at that point that we realized we were accidentally coaching a fixed mindset because we kept telling her that she was naturally talented, that she was more talented than others because it was an innate ability. It led her to uh, think that I, I shouldn't have to practice. Uh, if I'm really that good, uh, then why do I have to practice all the time? So what we realize is we, we need to shift our language a, a little bit. Uh, and no, it's a very small shift. Uh, instead of telling our daughter how proud we are because she's talented, we would say things like, wow, that practice has really paid off. I can really tell when you play that you've been practicing. I'm so, we're so proud of how hard you've been working. We can see it's, it's, it's paying off. If, you do, if a child does well in a test, we want to celebrate the hard work they put in not the mark that they get. If we celebrate the mark, 
then it creates a fixed mindset. that They're expected to get A's as opposed to expected to work hard. So if we want to nurture resilience and perseverance in children, then we need to make sure that the language we use supports that. So we'll just move on from that a little bit. Taking you way back, 1933, almost uh, 80 years ago, John Dewey said, uh, it, it's desirable to expel the notion that some subjects are inherently intellectual and hence possessed of an almost magical power to train the faculty of thought. Any subject, he, he suggests, is intellectual in its power to start and direct significant inquiry and reflection. I put this in this evening just, just to stress the point that I think that there's a, a sense of a hierarchy of subjects in, in schools, that, that math and science sit at the top of the most academically rigorous, and then other subjects you know, go in descending order. But I think it's important to note that, that it's not the subject itself that's intellectual, it's how it's taught or how it's approached. Memorizing information in history or science is not rigorous thinking. Solving problems in a parenting course or a fashion course is intellectual rigor. So notice that it's not the subject, but the way in which we approach the sub subject that gives the power of inquiry and the intellectual demands. So as we look at it, and, and much of the new curriculum coming out from governments these days, uh, not just here in Ontario, but across Canada and internationally, is putting more and more focus on an inquiry approach, uh, an approach that invites students to think critically, creatively, and collaboratively. So I thought we would just pause uh, and just comment on, on what does that mean to be intelligent. And Howard Gardner um, developed a theory of multiple intelligences uh, back in 1983, multiple intelligence theory. And at the time, he identified seven different intelligences. So he broadened this from the traditional li linguistic and mathematical logical. And he added uh, seven, and I'm going to try to type. So one was linguistic. One was um, mathematical uh, and logical. Just to type these in for you so you have them. There was interpersonal. Interpersonal is an intelligence that lets you read others well. Um, so people in sales and education and kind of social. Um, job and need good interpersonal skills, being able to read other people's body language, read their moods, be able to respond. There's intrapersonal. I'll put some of these up so, as I'm typing. Uh, intrapersonal is knowing yourself, being able to reflect, know your strengths, know your weaknesses, and so on. There's musical. Dr. Garfield, I'm, Dr. Garfield, I'm just interrupting you. Yes. Uh, when you're typing, you're not typing to everybody. Oh, okay. Thank you. You have to change that on the bottom. I don't have the choice to do everybody, so I'll just have to say it. So I'll just say them uh, uh, briefly to you. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Lisa. So there's linguistic, mathematical, logical, interpersonal, intrapersonal, musical, spatial. putting these up here. Those were the first seven that Howard Gardner identified. Uh, since then, he's identified two more. Uh, one was a, a naturalist intelligence. These are people with an, uh, well, I'll go back through them in just a moment. And the last one, a more recent, is existential. So those are the seven intelligences identified by Howard Gardner and the two additional ones. So when we talk about these, uh, I'll just briefly touch on them. A linguistic is strength with languages, uh, good writers, uh, oral speakers, uh, easily work with language, learn languages, and so on. Logical, mathematical, uh, good problem solving, uh, natural affinity with numbers, and so on. I mentioned interpersonal and intrapersonal. Musical is not just that you can play an instrument, but you tend to think in music, you tend to um, be comfortable with music. Music's a vehicle through which you would learn. Um, spatial, uh, landscapers have good spatial sense. Artists have good spatial sense that you can, um, fashion designers, um, 
interior designers that you walk into a room, you can imagine things, you can picture them. Um, so a good spatial sense, a sense of where you are, a sense of how you would fill the space. Naturalist intelligence, people are, have an affinity for identifying plants and working with plants and animals. Um, and lastly, ex existential, these are people who have an affinity for the big ideas of life, philosophical ideas, prefer philosophy, and so on. Now, the key thing with Gardner's work, by the way, is not that there are multiple ways of being intelligent, uh, that there's whether it's seven, eight, or nine. It's just that there's more than the traditional you know, writing and math and science. So I, I put up here his definition that intelligence is the ability to solve problems or fashion products that are of consequence in a particular cultural setting or community. So if you think about that, notice intelligence isn't the ability to recall lots of information. It's not the ability to store isolated facts. Intelligence, you can see here, is being able to use what you know to solve problems or create something that has value in a society. Uh, by the way, most researchers in the field of intelligence would agree with the definition of something like this, that it's what we do with what we know that defines intelligence. It's not being able to store lots of information. Now, I want to show you one other piece with Howard Gardner's work. There's another intelligence he identified, but not part of his nine. It's what he called distributed intelligence. And I'm going to come back to this from a student lens in just a moment. But distributed intelligence is the role that others and resources play. So if you accept the premise of the last slide, that intelligence is being able to solve problems or create something of value, then Gardner would argue that distributed intelligence is something we should think about. It's when I have a problem to solve, do I know what tools to use? Do I know what experts to call in? Who do I call in for support? That notice distributed intelligence is about intelligence being distributed in the world, not just in our head. That when I have a problem to solve, do I know how to assemble what I need, who, how to who to call in, who to help. Now, I'm mentioning this in your role as parents, so when you work with your children, notice if they have an opportunity to work in, at school on a school project, who should they have as their partner? Often students may want their best friend who's some just like them, but in fact, who, the, who you really want for your partner is someone who brings a different skill set to the problem than you do. If any of you have played Cranium, for example, Cranium was a game created after uh, the, the person who created the game had learned of Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences and then thought he'd create a game. And if you've played it, you'll notice that there's a linguistic box, there's a factual box, there's a, a box where you are more artistic and sculpting and drawing and so on, uh, and then there's a box with music and acting and humming. It's very much a multiple intelligence-based game. And if you've played, you've probably noticed that if you hope to win, the person you want to have playing with you as your partner is someone who brings a different set of skills to the table than you do. Otherwise, you both get stuck on the same one. So when our children are doing projects at school, what they want to do from a distributed intelligence model is think about who will bring talents to this project that will enhance the work I can already do. By the way, my guess is most of you listening tonight work in a work environment that's distributed intelligence, that, that each of us have a different role to play and together we can solve problems better than we can alone. So just looping back a little bit to the brain research, as I said last week, we or you know, last week, last month, we took a look at some key pieces around brain research. So here's a, a brief summary of that. First of all, we know emotion is the gatekeeper to learning. So one of the things that we know is that positive emotions transfer more information or transfer information better into long-term memory. If I find what I'm learning interesting, relevant, uh, useful to me in some way, my brain is more likely to both pay attention to and to store information that has a high emotional content. Something that I find boring, um, I'm disinterested, I see no value in it, it's not helping me in any way, it's difficult for the brain to store information that it, that it does not have an emotional content connection to. Here's the flip side. Negative emotions shut down learning. So the other thing we know, if I feel inhibited by, um, I'm being bullied in class, I'm having pressure put on, negative emotions will shut down learning. So we know that positive emotions enhance learning, negative emotions shut down learning. 
And by the way, that's, that's quite simply because when our brains encounter a threat, keep in mind our brains are built for survival. The number one purpose, our brains have been designed to keep us safe in the face of danger. So when I encounter danger, my brain releases adrenaline and cortisol to get me ready to defend myself wherever necessary against a possible threat. So if I perceive a threat, I'm put on the spot in a classroom, a parent's being overly demanding that I get uh, answer a question uh, correctly, uh, we, may, we may inadvertently uh, put that pressure on, but the child will downshift. They think they're getting in trouble. It becomes physiologically difficult for them to learn. So we know that positive emotions enhance learning, negative emotions inhibit learning. We also know that intelligence is a function of experience. And what we mean by that is you have to build on. Our brains, learning is making new connections. So our brains make connections. We see something, we hear something, we learn something new. Our brains attempt to connect it to something we already understand. If I can connect it to something I understand, I build a new neural pathway from what I already understood to the new learning. The more times that is repeated or fired, the stronger the learning becomes. So whenever possible, we need to build on top of something students already know or have experienced. And by the way, as a parent, if my child does not have any background or understanding, then what I want to do is try to create that experience. Watch a film with them, go out to a museum with them. The more we can move from concrete to abstract, the more powerful the learning. And lastly, as I was saying in the last piece, the brain will store most effectively what the learner sees um, as meaningful. So again, often curriculum is written uh, from the ministry in very teacher language, not student language. Our jobs as both parents and as educators is to try to help students see meaning behind the learning. Why do I need to know about confederation? What's the relevance for me? Why do I need to know this math or science? The learner needs to see meaning, and so we need to help the children see not just because it's good for them, but what, what will it do? We also know that anything that you do that creates a psychologically safe place will create optimal learning environments. So what we have to do is consider how do we engage our children's emotional uh, and motivational interests. We know that will give them stronger, stronger memories. And just a couple more pieces to, to set up the brain research piece, and then we'll shift to the critical thinking. It is normal and healthy for 99% of all information to, that enters through our senses during the day to be dropped. So if you stop and think about it, right now as I'm talking to you, I suspect you're sitting in a chair, which means nerve endings in your legs and your, and your behind are, being, are, are in contact with the chair. That is stimuli entering the brain. Uh, there's a light on in the room. Some might walk by while you're listening. Uh, you may have a fan running in your computer. Many of these things you don't even notice until I mention them to you. Because normal healthy brains filter out a lot of stimuli to focus on what the brain perceives as important. Uh, so that gives, that's, leads to, to two things we need to be conscious of. One is, how do we help children focus on what's important? They're paying attention to something. The question is, are they paying attention to what we need them to pay attention to? The brain is going to always drop 99% of stimuli coming in. It's going to filter out what's not necessary to keep it safe and what is relevant or interesting. So how to, if we don't establish relevance, it likely is part of the information purged from our brains. The second thing to think about is the fact that children with ADHD have trouble filtering out information. And, and imagine when I mentioned to you a fan in your computer, someone walking by, a flickering light, Imagine if every single piece of stimulus coming in, if you had trouble filtering that, how difficult it would be for you to be able to make sense of things, to store things. So you'll see my last note here. Every time we encounter something new, our brains need to fit it into an existing memory category or it will be lost. And so if we don't have one, as I said, we need to help students create that. Just to make the point. Let me show you a piece. I want you, I'm going to give you a couple minutes to read this piece, and then we'll talk about it.
Now I'm just going to take that away for a moment and I'm going to invite some of the organizers, if they would, to turn on their mics just for a moment and tell us if they can, as much as they can, about what they just read. So, Elisa, Josh, others, would you come on just for a moment, tell me what you just read. Sorry, I had Sorry, to go find my, my, my mute. mute. <laughs> Um, yeah. I read that there is something new coming out. That's what I was stuck on. Lisa Barb? I guess I don't want to. <laughs> okay. Well, let me let me go back to it. I suspect many of you, uh, if I could call in on your mics, you'd say. I don't really remember a lot of it. And, and by the way, when I bring it back up, I want you to note, I want to put make a couple of points on this. First of all, you read about the montillation of tracks lane. How many times for our children is this what a history class or a science class sounds like? That, that we talk to them about events in the past that are, are very old to them in language that is very foreign to them. By the way, if I left this up long enough, you could memorize it, and I could give you a quiz, and you could answer most of the questions on my quiz and do reasonably well and still have no understanding. Because what we want to do is try to make sense of them. By the way, that's my important second point. My guess is that many of you actually, if I asked you, what is Traxlane, you, could, you would be able to tell me what part of speech it is, for example. If I were to ask you what part of speech is Montiel'd, my guess is you'd tell me it's a verb. You can tell by where it's situated in the sentence. That you could tell me that Sarastana is a place. You know it's a proper noun. It has a capital letter. You know that there are Sarastanians and that they are likely people who live in Sarastana. Being Canadians living in Canada, you see the relationship between Sarastana and Sarastanians. My point to you here is you can actually make sense, a lot of sense, of something that is completely nonsensical just by your understanding of the structure of language. By the way, if you've read your children, Dr. Seuss, you've done the same thing. He uses a lot of nonsensical language, but he uses it in context and we can make sense of it. I'm showing you this because if you show this to students or if the learning of them appears this way and we don't do something to help them understand it, then you'll see it's a very surface, a very superficial memorization of some information to get through a test to get on to the next piece of curriculum but there's no real deep learning or understanding. So, I'm just curious, I, I wonder for how many of you this is what history felt like when you were in school. That it was these variety of dates or names or people that were tossed at us to be memorized. That much like the montillation of Traxlene, School sometimes can feel like a lot of jumbled information being thrown at us and a lot of time to make sense of it. And so the big shift happening in education these days is more and more to move away from the memorization of isolated bits of information and more and more towards getting students to digest, to understand, to use, to apply information, to be able to think, to be able to use information. So I want just to put this slide up just so you can see what sometimes I think our, our children feel when they get overwhelmed with information and don't really make sense of a whole lot of it. Now some of you may be twitching right now with memories, bad memories of school, so we'll get that off of there. Art Costa wrote a, a number of years ago, you can see in 2008, thinking is innate, but skillful thinking must be cultivated. All of us think. It's human to think. But if we want our children to be skillful thinkers, then we have to help cultivate skillful thinking. And that's where I want to shift our, our evening. How do we take what we know about the brain, about the developing a learner, and use that to help cultivate good thinkers? Now, I'm going to give you a task. And because we can't talk directly, it's a little more difficult. But I'm going to invite you to take about three or four minutes 
And I want you to take a look at this picture. This picture is Burnaby, British Columbia in the year 1942. So the picture is Burnaby, British Columbia in 1942. I'm going to invite in the chat window, Barb, uh, Josh, and Lisa, if you wouldn't mind, helping answer the question as best you can, and others just to yourself, jot some thoughts down. This is Burnaby, British Columbia in 1942. I would like you to tell me what month this is, what day of the week this is, and approximately what time of day. So I'm looking for the month, the day of the week, and the time of day. Use all the evidence you can find to support your answer. Don't ignore evidence if it doesn't fit your answer. And if there's any contradictions in the picture, how do you explain them? So, give you about three or four minutes, look for all the evidence you can, month, day of the week, time of day. Okay? Go. So, I wanted to uh, just mention something. Okay, a couple of thoughts here. You may not have noticed, but I want you to take a close look in the bottom left. There's a woman wearing a large brimmed hat. If you can see my cursor, I'm circling around her. She's in the bushes here, probably picking raspberries. So the woman in the corner, probably picking raspberries. The other thing I want to mention, in Burnaby, the mountains that you see in the top of the picture are in the north, and the plain where you see the house setting is in the south. Simon Fraser University is now right up in those mountains, nestled up in there. So the plain is to the south, the mountain is in the north. I'm just going to give you another minute or two, see if you want to make any revisions, additions, or confirmations on what you were saying. Okay, now, I'm just going to point out a few things. First of all, when we do an exercise like this with students, we give them a, a five W. We ask them, where's the picture taking place? When's it taking place? Who's in the picture? What's happening in the picture? So we use a five W's approach. But then we use two columns to help them. And get your children to routinely do this. We ask them, what's directly observable? What do you see in the picture? And then in a separate column, what can you infer from what you see? So in column one, so if I ask who's in the picture, 
you can say, well, I see four people and a dog. I, th I see um, people gardening, uh, feeding chickens, and so on. My inference is that I think, I, my, I'm going to infer that given the, the apron that I see, that's a woman over there, a man over there, and so on. My conclusion might be, I see two adult women and one man, and it's 1942. I think this may be grandma and grandpa coming over to help their daughter while her husband's away at war. So notice my observation. I see three adults and a child. I infer that I see a younger woman, an older woman, and a man based on some clues. I draw a conclusion. We want children to use clues like this to say, I see an open window. I can infer from that that it's warm. Therefore, I think it's June, which would make sense to me. The woman's picking raspberries. I typically pick my raspberries in July, but I know that the climate in BC is a bit warmer, milder than ours, so I wonder if they might pick theirs a little earlier, making fitting with this being late June. But she's feeding the chickens. Hmm. Typically, you feed chickens in the morning, and yet you told me the mountains are in the north. If the mountains are in the north, then the sun would have to be to the left of this picture in the west in order for that shadow behind the man to be cast the way it's cast. That would make it early afternoon. Yet she's feeding chickens. How do I explain that? So we work our way through this, and we try to come up with a reasonable answer. Now, there's two things I want you to point out. I want you to notice that I've just engaged a lot of critical thinking, observation, inference, drawing conclusions, and I've done it without you having to read a word. And I use this often to make the point that you don't have to be a strong reader to be a good thinker. That sometimes if a child is struggling with their reading, or perhaps they're an ESL learner, that we assume that they can't think and solve problems because their reading's not strong. It's a flawed assumption. All children can engage in, in thinking activities, and they find it a more interesting way to learn. So I was using this picture just to make the point all children can think, what we want to do is give them the tools to do that thinking carefully. Build some background. By the way, notice what I did is I stepped in and said, oh, by the way, she's picking raspberries and the mountains are in the north. I didn't tell you the answer. I gave you some more information that would allow you to arrive at an answer. So when we help support our children, how do I help ask questions, drop in more information that will help move them through their thinking without doing the thinking for them? So a couple of things here. What is critical thinking? A couple of key things that we need to understand as we talk about critical thinking. Our interest in critical thinking is what's reasonable or sensible. That I'm less interested in the former picture that you saw. Let me just go back there for one second. You'll notice in the Burnaby picture that I did not tell you the answer in the end. Partly because I don't know the exact answer. But increasingly in schools, I'm, we're less interested in whether or not students get the right answer or wrong answer, and we're more interested in whether they arrive at a sound answer. So note that difference, right and wrong answers versus sound and weak answers. And so in critical thinking, our interest is, is in children judge or assess what's reasonable. Our focus is on quality of reasoning, so less on memorization of information, more on how they use that information to help them reason through and make a decision. But this does not mean that students don't need to know content. As you'll notice here, we say it depends on the possession of relevant knowledge. If you know absolutely nothing about life in British Columbia, you will not be able to answer the question I posed on that slide. Uh, by the way, when I've spoken in the Middle East or in Europe, I don't use the picture of Burnaby. They don't have enough context to work. So if you have no background, you can't think critically. So sometimes there's a myth that critical thinking, um, there, there are, there are, you know, that students don't have to know their content. Well, you still have to know about science, about math, about history, if you're going to engage in good critical thinking. You can't make thoughtful decisions if you don't know about the subject matter. Next, we have critical thinking. We engage our children in critical thinking when we give them a problematic situation to solve. We give them some kind of dilemma or issue or problem to work with, that's engaging them in critical thinking. And the last thing I'll mention is that we know it takes more effort from students, 
but they find it more interesting, they're more engaged in learning, even though the thinking is more difficult. So, a couple of key things. When is someone thinking critically? First of all, for someone to be thinking critically, they have to be making an assessment or a judgment of some kind. If they're not making some kind of judgment, it's actually not critical thinking. So if I asked a, a child to compare life in Milton today and 100 years ago, compare and contrast, so what similarities and what differences? Let, let, let's say your child's in grade 8 and they're looking at information about life in, 18, in 1890. And they find out information and they ask, compare similarities and differences. That's not a critical thinking task. I could set up a chart, 1890s on one side, 2014 on the other. I write similarities and differences down and I'm finished. If you change that question to how similar or different was life in the past, was it very similar, somewhat similar, or not very similar, now I'd have a judgment to make. So note critical thinking is when we invite children to make a judgment of some kind. And the next piece that's really important, and, and children often confuse this, and they think that critical thinking is to be critical or to criticize. Critical thinking is not to criticize. It's not to be critical. It's to make thoughtful decisions using criteria to guide us. So when we use criteria, and by the way, I suspect as adults, we, we do this all the time. We do this in a very natural way. Children, not always. We need to help them think about how would we make that decision. What criteria would you use? So imagine tomorrow, you know, it's Friday, if you've had a long week, often on a Friday night, many people will, will choose to go out for dinner. How do you decide where to go for dinner after a long week? Well, you could go somewhere that you're really craving something, which would not be a critical thinking response, or you could go somewhere where you use criteria to help you decide. So for our family, just to give you an example, we would choose somewhere that we're not going to have to wait a long time. It's got to be efficient with my time because I'm, I'm too tired to wait around. So is it somewhere I will be efficient with my time? Two, um, if we're going to do this on a regular basis, it can't be overly expensive. It has to be affordable and fit within our budget. And three, it has to have healthy food that, that meets the needs and likes of the people going. So my three criteria, where should I go for dinner? It needs to be efficient with my time, affordable within our budget, and have food that we enjoy and is healthy. Three criteria. So you notice I can use criteria to help me make almost any decision. Okay? How do I decide what to prepare for dinner, what vehicle to buy, uh, where to go on vacation, can I afford it, would I enjoy it, uh, are the activities activities I, I would enjoy doing. So critical thinking is making thoughtful decisions applying criteria. So I'm going to show you, this is a framework that you heard in the introduction, I'm a senior consultant with a critical thinking consortium, and this is the framework, just a bit modified for parents, about how do we help nurture our children as thoughtful learners, as good critical thinkers, as learners. One of the things I would encourage you to do is to encourage an open discussion of issues that, that help you know, engage students in, in conversations around the election going on right now. Or, our daughter was asking us lots of questions at dinner about how do we decide who to vote for. Have those open discussions with kids and get them to, to hmm, how, how should we decide? What criteria should we use? Invite them to solve problems or offer thoughtful assessments. So when you go to a movie, instead of just asking, did you like the movie, was it a well-made movie? Do you think that should be an award-winning movie? What criteria should we use to decide what film should win the award? Which of those actors do you think was, was the best? And by best, I mean most convincing, most consistent. If I gave a child, if I asked them to assess something, a movie, a TV program, and so on, but in light of criteria, I'm not simply asking did they like, I'm asking them to think about it. Let me give you another example just in another way. When, when our, our older son was uh, a teenager, he would ask me, what time do I need to be home? And I would respond by saying, I don't know, make me an offer. And he would say, well, 3 o'clock. And I'd say, yeah, I was thinking 10 o'clock. And he'd say, Dad, that's not fair. And I'd say, well, I'm not sure 3 o'clock is fair. Because, like most mothers, if Matthew wasn't home, his mother wasn't sleeping. So if he's coming home at 3, 
She's not getting to sleep until after 3. And she's got to be up in the morning with things to do. So I would ask him, well, let's think about what would be fair to everyone involved. Now make me another offer. Now, by the way, I knew exactly what time, how late I'd be willing to uh, allow him to be out. But if I simply give him the answer, I'm not nurturing his frontal lobes. I'm not getting him to do the thinking. And then when he becomes older, he doesn't know how to make decisions on his own. So I would invite students, or my children, I would invite them to think about what would be reasonable. And then if they needed guidance, I'd give them criteria for reasonable, how, the impact on others, the impact on yourself. Um, you know, the event that you're going to, does it make sense to go out if you had to be back at 10? That seems too early to me. So getting children to have to do their own thinking helps them become more independent in their thinking. By the way, one other example of that. One of the most common things I'll have parents tell me, uh, you know, if your child comes home from school and you say, so what did you do in school today? Chances are most kids say nothing. And they do that because you essentially ask them to give you a list of whatever they've done in school. And I have to say, I don't blame children for saying, I don't really feel like giving you a list of everything I did in school today. Try this instead. Tell me the most useless thing you did in school today. I'll bet you'll get a response. And then invite students to tell you, so why did you find that useless? Tell me something useful you learned in school today. What made that useful? You'll prompt deeper thinking and ask them to give you a list. And the work we've done in the Critical Thinking Consortium, we've identified five intellectual tools that children need if we're going to engage them in critical thinking. So if you hope your children are going to be good thinkers, then these are the five tools that they need and we need to help them build. The first tool is background knowledge. As I said earlier, you can't think critically if you don't know anything about the topic. So when your children have homework and if they're struggling, one of the first things we need to look at is do they have sufficient background? Do they know the mathematical concept? Do they know the historical event? If I don't know the event, the math concept, the science term, I can't engage in the more difficult questions. So do they have the background? If not, where might they acquire that? The second tool is criteria for judgment. Have children thought about how they'll make their decision? What criteria would they use? So notice if they're asked to assess a character, what criteria would they use to, to render their assessment? It's not whether I like or dislike the character, it's were they heroic, were they sympathetic, well what's your criteria? By the way, those two, background knowledge and criteria for judgment, are the two pillars of all critical thinking. Those are the two pieces that you cannot be engaged in critical thinking without. I have to have something to think about. I have to have some criteria to help guide me. The third one is, do the children understand the language of thinking? We often find that children will struggle because they didn't really understand the language of the question. So for example, we will see in EQAO test results, where a child fails the reading section on the test, not because they didn't know the couldn't do the reading or didn't understand the reading, but because they didn't understand the language of the question. If I don't know what it means to analyze or infer or evaluate or appraise, then I can't do the tasks you've given me. As a parent, we need to look at when our children are doing homework, make sure they understand what they're being asked to do, and if they don't, we help them develop that understanding. The fourth tool are thinking strategies. How do we help kids take information? Notice before I gave you a thinking strategy where I said to use the five W's, who, what, where, when, why, two columns, tell me what you see, what's directly observable, tell me what you can infer, now draw your conclusion. There's a thinking strategy. So the more we can help children figure out ways to organize information, see patterns, see trends, the more we can support their thinking. And lastly, if we want our children to be good thinkers, they need to develop the habits of good thinkers. And just a few of these, for example, are, and one of the top most significant ones is perseverance. That if children are going to succeed in life, being able to persevere is one of the top habits they need to develop. Okay, so, so perseverance, attention to detail, open-mindedness, empathy, these are all habits of good thinkers. So those are the five tools kids need if they're going to be thoughtful as learners and thoughtful in their thinking. So I'm just going to show you 
we talk about, and it's helpful for your children to be able to recognize the type of question they're being asked. So we talk about three types of questions. If you take a look at all the type one questions on the left-hand side, you'll notice they're list questions. They're retrieval questions. They're, they're questions I could look up. I could Google it. I could read the side of the box. I can recall it, just memorize it. Okay? I, it doesn't ask me to make a decision. It doesn't ask me to show deep understanding. It simply asks for retrieval. When you go to column two, you'll notice the questions in column two are preference questions. They're asking me how I feel about something. Now, there is a decision here. Unlike question one, there is a decision to be made in type two. But you'll notice that decision is in my gut. It's not a frontal lobe, as we'd say in the neuroscience. It's not a frontal lobe decision. It's, it's an emotional response. Okay? I like, I dislike but it's not, a, it's not rendering an assessment. When I move over to type three, type three questions also require a decision, but you'll notice they require a decision that would apply criteria and evidence. For example, would your need, family's needs be better met in Toronto or Mississauga? To answer that question, I'd have to know what your family's needs are. That would give me my criteria. I'd have to know what services, what opportunities exist in Toronto or Mississauga. That would give me my evidence. If I weighed my evidence against my criteria, I can make a thoughtful decision. Okay? So you'll notice type three questions are the kind of questions that get kids thinking critically. So just as an example, why do people go shopping? People go shopping for clothes, for groceries, for gifts, for therapy. I could write a list of ten reasons people go shopping but I've never made a judgment. I simply gave you a list. Do you like shopping? My guess is with the people on this evening, if I were to oops, ask that question, I'd get a, a wide range of answers. I'd get some people saying no, some people saying yes, uh, some people saying it depends who I'm shopping with. We would have a wide range of different answers. Just give you a minute to think about what might a type three question about shopping be. I'm just gonna pause for about two minutes and have you think about, and then I'll come back and anticipate what you might think about, but what would a type three question be that would deal with shopping? So let me just come back in and just uh, anticipate kinds of questions that you may have been thinking about. And here's how we test out if a question is a type 1, 2, or 3. If it's a type 3 question, a judgment question, then it will require that I make a decision of some kind, and I can generally apply criteria to make that decision. So for example, if I asked, uh, Am I better to shop at Square One or the new outlet mall in Milton? That would be a judgment question because you've asked me to make a decision. You've given me two locations, and you've asked me to make a decision where it would be best to shop. And I could give you criteria. Is it ease of access? Where would I get the best selection? Where is the most comfortable shopping experience? Where do they have the best prices? Is it better to shop online or in person? Where will I have the best selection, best price, most convenient, and so on. So notice when I ask questions like that, you're inviting me to make a judgment using criteria. I'll just show you now. Here are some sample questions pulled from some work in schools. Which of, these, which of the theories used by scientists to explain the dinosaur's disappearance from the face of the Earth is most plausible? 
The first half, uh, or sorry, that question is a type three question, a critical thinking question. If I asked you to list three theories used to explain the disappearance, that would be a type one. You would just give me three theories. But because it asks you which is most plausible, I need to generate criteria for plausible, and I'd have to be able to gather evidence to support my answer. Notice it's not any answer that I want. It's what would make a sound answer, considering the evidence and considering the criteria I'm using. If I were to ask instead, I want you to paint an image using an impressionist style. Often I'll have people tell me, they, they, they'll start by saying, oh, I think that's a type one question. Now watch how I just tweak that a bit. If I asked you, if I held up a, a copy of a Monet painting and said, I'd like you to create a, a copy of this Monet painting for me, that would be a type one, simply make a copy. But if I asked you to find somewhere around your property or your home, and capture an impression style, you would have to understand what impressionism is, what are the key attributes of it, and transfer it or use it in a new context. That would be a three. You'd have to make judgments about how you would apply the concept of impressionism. This one, if I, again, if I, now if I take the first part, list three methods of harvesting trees used in Ontario. If I put a period there, that would be type one. List three methods of harvesting trees used in Ontario, type one. But if I go on to ask and rank order them from most to least sustainable, notice it becomes a type three. Okay? So once I ask the child to do something with that information, where I would use criteria, what makes something sustainable, and which of these would best meet my criteria, I have a critical thinking question. This one's always an interesting one. Prepare a list of holiday presents for your family. This can be a type one, two, or three. I'm sure many of you have received gifts that have been type one. Type one works something like this. Remember, type one is a list. So how do I get my list of holiday presents? I call you up and I ask you. Your birthday's coming up. I need to get shopping. What would you like? Father's Day is coming up in a couple of weeks. If my children come to me and say, could you tell me three things you'd like? I'll go pick one up for you. Type one. Type two is often tricky for people. If my daughter went out and bought something that she thinks I would like, that'd still be a type three. She's thinking about me and my likes. Her criteria would be, I want to pick up something for dad that I can afford and that I think he would enjoy. Those are her criteria. If my son went out to pick up a gift for me and thought, hmm, I think I'll pick up this, this, this um, golf club for him. I'm not sure he'll like it, but I, I think it's pretty cool. If he doesn't like it, I'll keep it. Notice if I buy a gift motivated by what I like with the thought that if you don't like it, I'll just keep it, then that becomes a type two. A column two question is a question where I bought bit motivated by what I like. So when's it a type three? Notice when I said if my daughter had to think about my interests. So when you sit back and you think, hmm, what should I buy my dad for Father's Day? Can I afford it? Can I get it to him? Would he use it? Would he enjoy it? I have to be thoughtful about my choices. These are, and sorry for the poor quality of the image, there are essentially six ways that we engage children in thinking critically. There's essentially six things you can do to help your child think critically. And here are the six different ways. When I asked you to look at that Burnaby picture, you were doing a decode the puzzle. I'd given you a situation and I asked you to come up with a possible solution or explanation using evidence to support. So when children are asked to interpret a poem, figure out the main idea in a story, uh, do a lab in science, they're doing a decode the puzzle. They're trying to figure something out. So when they're trying to solve, when they're trying to read material or watch or observe and figure something out, they decode. When they assess the, the shortcomings or merits of a person, product, or performance, they're doing a critique. So with a critique the piece, the children are being asked, you know, when my daughter asked today about who would make the most effective leader in Ontario, that's a judge the better or best. Has Kathleen Wynne been an effective premier would be a critique. So you notice critique, I take one person, one event, one of something, and I apply a set of criteria to assess it. 
would you consider D-Day, today being the anniversary, 70th anniversary, one of the top 10 most important events in the history of the world? Okay, how important was it for T? Here are four events. Which one do you think should make the top 10 list, judge the better best? If I ask you to rework, what if I change the perspective on the person who's answering that question through the lens of? So when we ask children, if you're to take a painting of a nice summer day, and using the exact same setting, draw me that picture in the winter, they would have to rework it. If I changed a variable in a math problem, what would be the likely impact would be a rework? When we move down to performed aspects, when children participate in sports, do a presentation, play music, act in drama, the performing aspects. And that means, do they have criteria to guide them and think about, do I need to make adjustments? How am I doing at this point? What, what could I change to improve now? That would be a performed aspect. And finally, a designed aspect is when children have to create something, write a paragraph, write an essay, write up a lab report, create a poster, shoot, make a video. Design aspects is when students are invited to create something to show their thinking and learning. I'm just going to show you a couple of examples. We'll have a little bit of fun with this one. The top line that you see before you are all whammy knackers. None of the middle line are whammy knackers. Are there any whammy knackers on the bottom line? Now, to do this exercise, what I usually ask people to do is to take a close look at the top ones and see what you notice that all whammy and actors share in common. Okay. I'm going to just pause for a moment and let you have a look about what do you notice about all whammy and actors. So just look at the top line and ask yourself, how many features do those whammy and actors share that are common to all of them? Just give me a minute to look it over. So I'm watching our time. What I'm going to do is just point out that what you may have noticed is that all whammy and actors have four feet, four legs, four body parts, a head, and a tail. Okay. So if we look to the second line, you could probably tell me that the first one is not a whammy and actor. It has too many body parts. The second one is not a whammy and actor. It has too few body parts. But the third and fourth one have four legs, four feet, four body parts, a head, and a tail. They have all the attributes that I just mentioned of a whammy knacker. So what makes them non-whammy knackers? And you try to find an attribute shared by all the whammy knackers on top that is not shared by the ones on bottom. So if you look at the third whammy knacker on the middle row, and you look at the patterning relative to the last one on the top row, you may notice that the third body part in the middle row is red. And then you may notice that on the top whammy knacker, or sorry, the middle, the third one is yellow on the middle, sorry, the third whammy knacker on the middle row, whereas it's red on the top whammy knacker on the right. In fact, if you look across all whammy knackers, all whammy knackers have a red third body part. So a whammy knacker has a head and tail, four legs, four feet, four body parts, and its third body part is always red. So, are any of the bottom ones whammy knackers? Well, the first one meets all our criteria. The second one, although it has four legs, four feet, four body parts, a head and a tail, does not have a red body part in the right place. It is not a whammy knacker. Nor is the third one. But the last one does meet our criteria. So that's what you call a decode the puzzle. Okay? That you had a puzzle in front of you to try to figure out what makes a whammy knacker a whammy knacker and you had to solve the problem from there. Here's a more likely one to use in classrooms, uh, grade 8 history, for example. We give children a cartoon, and we ask them, is Canadian diversity the result of or in spite of? First, they have to decode the picture, figure out doing five Ws, who's in this cartoon, where's it taking place, what's happening, and so on. So they begin to notice that all the characters are in here are all from Northern Europe or the U.S. 
they're standing in a wheat field with Canada hosting. Okay? So they probably feel it's a wheat field and it's very flat. It's probably the prairies. And it's all Europeans and an American. And they're saying now then all together. Well, the American, Uncle Sam, and the British, John Bull, sing from the Maple Leaf forever. So the first thing kids do is figure out the message in the poem, that they want to assimilate people so we're all singing off the same page. And then we ask students to create a want ad. So what if this wasn't a cartoon? What if it was a, a, a wanted immigrant who? What would it say? That would be a design to spec, create that. And if I said, what if you were to recreate the same cartoon but set in 2014 instead? Would the people still be in a wheat field? Who would be in the picture in today's version? That would be a rework piece. In case you have younger children at home, I'll just show you a couple of more. Chester the Cat is a wonderful story by Melanie Watt. And Chester goes around with a big red marker you can see in his hand. And wherever you see Chester's red marker, you can see he's jumped up and written. So he's crossed out Melanie's name and put his in. He's put his name up there. So I'll show young children the start of the book, that the author is trying to find out a way to put an end to this cat's behavior, who jumps up and writes, good luck, Einstein. As you can tell, Chester, a.k.a. the rude and self-centered furball, always have to has, has, has to have the last word. Not true. You see? You see what? What I tell you? Whatever. So you can see Chester. He's up there writing in red. So Melanie began writing her story. Once upon a time, there was a mouse. He lived in a house in the country. And then Chester jumped up and wrote, then Mouse packed his bags and went on a trip very, very far away, and we never saw him ever again. So I then show students, and this is for young children where I want to introduce in grade one or two, I want to introduce them to the concept of perspective. So other than the Hasta la Vista Mousy, how do we know this is a mouse picture, not a cat picture? And children are invited to come up or to tell me all the different ways that they know this is a mouse picture. So they'll say things like the pictures on the wall are all of mice, that there's cheese on the table and mice like cheese, that the mouse is smiling and he's in the middle of the picture. So notice they've just done a decode the puzzle. They've looked for clues that would tell them what, would, what perspective is represented here. And then they've, they've gone through that and given uh, their answer. Then I ask them, well, imagine you got to be Chester. Tell me what you would change in this picture. And if I give them a copy of the picture and a marker, and say, turn this into a cat picture. What would you change? And so many of the children will put cat ears and whiskers on the mice to make them look like cats. And they'll change the cheese from cheese to a fish. And they'll put a scratching post and um, something for the cat to play with and all kinds of things. Now they've done a rework the piece. So notice, figure out what perspective is represented. What changes would you make to change the perspective? So we have kids decode and then rework. Just a, a couple more examples, and, and again, for young children in this case. If we want to help someone out, we might read a, a, a story to children, like a handful of seeds, and invite children to think, how could you make a contribution to someone else? How could you help someone in need? And so we read them a bit of the story, and I'll just give you a little bit of context. The, the story is about children living in the barrios in Brazil. And the little girl is invited to help them steal food. But instead, she says, well, I have corn, beans, and chilies. And the children think, well, that's not enough for a meal. Well, what the girl does is teaches the children how to plant a garden. And then they have all kinds of food. So I won't go through all of this with you, but we read the story and then we talk to children about criteria that we could do to help make someone's life better. It should make a lasting difference, not just help them for one meal. What would make a lasting difference? Respect their dignity, their, their, their um, sense of, of self and, and looking after themselves. It has to be realistic or feasible. You know, if we're talking to seven-year-olds, what can you do that will make a difference? And what would you find meaningful? What would you enjoy doing? And then we might give children a list of here are four possible things we could do. Which one will best meet our criteria? So notice what we have there, a challenge for children to think about how could we make a difference, build some background about what it means to make a difference, provide some choices, 
provide some criteria, and here you have a thinking strategy. So we're bringing together a variety of those intellectual tools to help kids think. So I'm going to finish the, this, this evening by summarizing the 10 ways, which is why we call to talk this, 10 ways you can help nurture thinking in your child, which will help them be successful in school. And then we'll pause for a few minutes for some questions. So first of all, help your children recognize invitations to think critically. And what I mean by that is help them recognize when the question is simply asking for a recall or list or is it asking for a judgment. So watch for those key words that are inviting children to make a decision of some kind. And when I say the nature, are they being asked to decode, to figure out the puzzle? Are they being asked to critique? Are they being asked to judge? Are they being asked to design? If they recognize that they're being asked to make a judgment and the nature of the judgment, they'll better handle the task. Before your child attempts to tackle the task and make the judgment we're asking them to make, have they gathered sufficient background? Have they learned it in school? Do they have it from prior learning? Do they need to do additional research? So do, do, do your children know what they're being asked to do? Do they understand the nature of the challenge they have? Have they gathered enough information? Have they thought about what criteria they'll use to make their judgment? So when they're being asked to make a decision, they need to pause and ask themselves, how will I make that decision? What criteria would, would, would guide me? Make sure that, that in answering the question, that the child uses both evidence and the criteria so that they can make you know, a thoughtful decision by definition is when the evidence is used to support the criteria to help me make my judgment. If a child sets out some criteria but fails to link the evidence to the criteria, chances are they're writing about something that they prefer, they're not giving a thoughtful assessment. So the use of both criteria and evidence is essential for a thoughtful or well-reasoned answer. One of the things you can do as parents to help your child is to make sure they understand what's required. In other words, understand their critical thinking vocabulary. Ask your child, do they understand what an inference is, what an analysis is, what an appraisal? If they don't know the question, then one of the things we need to do is to go online or in some way find examples, find definitions, make sure they understand what the question's asking. Otherwise, children can go down a long road, put in a lot of effort, but in fact answer the wrong question, and as a result, not do as well as they should. Okay, number six, consider framing your own questions around assessments, not lists. So as I said, instead of, what'd you do today, list, tell me the most useless thing. Instead of, what are things we could do this weekend, list question, here are four ideas I have, which one is most, which one do you think would be the best for us to, judgment. Let's generate a list of all the things we could do, and then how would we decide which one? What criteria would we use? So find ways to frame questions that invite children to make decisions, to make judgments, not just provide lists. I think it's very important that children are skeptical, but not cynical. Right? We need to help children question. Okay? Is what I saw in, on the news, online, what I heard from my friend, does that make sense? Could I check that against other evidence? So we want our children to be skeptical, but just because it's in their textbook doesn't mean it's true. Just because they saw it online doesn't make it true. Just because someone takes out a political ad doesn't mean it's true. Okay? I should be skeptical, which means I need to check, I need to find out, I need to assess claims. But I, I really want to be careful we don't create cynical kids who think there's no use voting because it's, not, it's a waste or you can't trust politicians or, you know, there's conspiracies behind everything. So we want children to question, to wonder, but not be cynical. When I showed you the whammy knackers, you were essentially doing a concept attainment. A concept attainment, you were arriving at the concept or idea of a whammy knacker by looking for the attributes. We can do this every day with children. I was working with teachers yesterday in Calgary, outside of Calgary actually in Strathmore, and they were trying to define powerful learning. What does powerful learning look like in our classrooms? And I asked them quite simply, could you give me examples? Now could you give me non-examples? Could you tell me what it wouldn't look like if when students were engaged in learning, when it's not powerful learning? What would that look like? 
And that just seemed to help unlock all kinds of ideas when, when the thinking was, well, it would look like this, but it wouldn't look like that. Getting children to think about all kinds of issues. What would, what would it look like if you had a really well done project? What would it look like if it wasn't so well done? What does it sound like, look like, seem like when you do something well or poorly? It would just be a way to help students assess their own work. So imagine them asking them on a Saturday morning, I'd like you to clean your room. Could you tell me what it would look like if you've done an excellent job? And tell me what you'll look like if you've done a job that doesn't quite cut the mustard. And get the children to do their own. Now, which one do you have here? And they can do their own assessment. And help children see the difference between what they like versus something of high quality. Of course, it's important that we know, did you enjoy this? What's your favorite flavor? Those are you know, it's important parts of who they are as people. But in terms of supporting their thinking, there are times in which we want children to assess the merits or assess the quality, not just tell us what they like. And then they have to be thinking and using criteria. And lastly, Encourage children to consider different perspectives. That whether they're writing or creating or learning in schools, that they think, how might someone else feel about that? What might be a different view? Is there always a single answer? Are there pos other possible answers? So, I don't know why that just jumped out. Pull that back. I'm at the end anyway. I hope I'm still on. I suddenly it jumped out on me. So I, we're at 9:20. I think we have a bit of time for some questions if uh, that might have come out of that. I hope there are some helpful bits there. Uh, critical thinking and, and creativity are are certainly hot topics these days in schools. Uh, as I said earlier, many ministries uh, are moving towards critical thinking being a central underpinning in in, in curriculum. Uh, increasingly, uh, success in many careers requires in, uh, students' ability to think and solve problems. So I hope there are bits and pieces there that might be helpful um, for you as a parent in supporting your child uh, just in becoming good thinkers themselves or in doing the kind of homework that they may be seeing. So I'm going to stop there, put the last item up. Let me do that. There we go. And I'm assuming they want to, whoops. Sorry, Lisa, let me just try that once more. Let me just bring up all the pieces. There we go. So let me just. So I'll uh, stop there and, and invite uh, questions or a selection of questions that, that I might be able to answer. Hello, that was, that was a wonderful presentation, um, and I'm hearing myself in echo, so if I stop talking sometimes, it's only because I'm waiting for myself to catch up. Um, somebody did ask for the last number to be uh, shown again, and you did that. Uh, for the rest, there are no questions, um, which means that, uh, Dr. Newman, you answered uh, everything that people had in mind that they wanted to learn. So I'd like to thank you on behalf of CPIC for your presentation, for both your presentations um, this, um, this, um, this uh, month, and hopefully we'll have you back on in the fall. I'd like to also thank everybody, all the parents who were in attendance today and for all the other webinars we've had, and I'd like to thank Lisa Coster and Barb Belanger for helping out tonight with technical support. And I'd like to thank, uh, give everybody a, wish everybody, sorry, a very um, happy and uh, safe summer. And we'll see you all in, the, all in the fall. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Garfield. And to everybody else, good night. Thank you very much. Unmuted. Great, thanks, and good night, everyone.